Hello. For this week, we're going to be thinking about Christianity as it exists beyond the boundaries of the Roman Empire. And then we're also going to be spending some time thinking about the development of Christian asceticism and monastic movements. So let's start with thinking about the aftermath of the Council of Chalcedon, which is where we ended last time. The purpose of this council was to provide a formal, unanimous declaration of faith that would emanate out from the authority of the Patriarch of Constantinople and then be accepted by the rest of the churches. In the West, with the church uh, that's organized around Rome, the formula of Chalcedon and the proceedings of the council were easily accepted. However, in the Eastern regions, the church split in three different ways over Chalcedon. There is a rejection of Chalcedon by a majority of uh, the churches in Egypt, where Alexandria was, Ethiopia, Syria, India, and Armenia. And those organize around a monophysite Christology, which I'll explain in a second. And then there are also Chalcedonian churches that remain in territories of Antioch, Jerusalem, and Alexandria. And then there are also churches that organize around the figure and teachings of Nestorius and his successors. So in the eastern part of the empire, then, we have three different churches that begin to emerge. We have the supporters of Chalcedon, and they will say, in terms of Christology, that Jesus Christ has two natures united in one person. This is what we saw in the formula. This is the official position supported in both the western and eastern parts of the empire by the churches that are affiliated with the empire in some formal way. In the east, we will call these churches the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Greek Orthodox Church, uh, etc. Then there is this non-Chalcedonian view that we would call monophysite. This position upholds Cyril, against all other options, and this emphasizes this unity in person over an emphasis on two natures. We would call these the Oriental Orthodox Church. So the church that we now call the Coptic Church, the Ethiopian Church, the Armenian Church, all fall in this non-Chalcedonian monophysite perspective. And then finally, we have something called a diophysite perspective. And this is a position that upholds the teachings of Nestorius and Theodore of Mopsuestia against all other positions. This church develops mostly beyond the area of Roman imperial control in the areas of the Persian Empire. And this church comes to be called the Church of the East, which is different than Eastern Orthodox Church or Oriental Orthodox Church. So we have the use of the word East and Church in a couple of different ways here that we want to pay attention to. So a little bit of the background of this, and you saw some of us if you've been doing the McCullough readings also. By the late 400s, so in the half century after the Council of Chalcedon, there is an attempt by various emperors to reconcile the various church positions, but the various groups never come to terms. In the 530s, really now almost a century after Chalcedon, there is a real emergence of non-Chalcedonian church hierarchies that are beginning to serve divided communities. So you can have a city or a region that would now have multiple uh, bishops, say, multiple cathedrals in the same jurisdiction. And this leads to a variety of persecutions on different sides. No one group is innocent here. And then a century later, in the 630s, the army of the Eastern Roman Empire, the army affiliated with the teachings of the Eastern Orthodox Church, kills a variety of dissidents in Alexandria who hold the Monophysite position just before the Arab conquest emerges out of the Arabian Peninsula that then cuts off Antioch and Alexandria, the centers of Myophysite and Diophysite perspectives from the rest of the empire situated in Constantinople that holds the Orthodox 
position. And so we see how Chalcedon, although arriving at a solution, inadvertently leads to a three-way division within the Christianity of the Eastern Mediterranean and beyond. So let's spend a little bit of time familiarizing ourselves with Christianity beyond the Roman Empire. And let's start with talking about the Church of the East. You might not have ever heard of this church before. So let's walk through it a little bit. First, let's talk about its polity. It's autocephalous. It's an autocephalous Episcopal church. That means it has a single head. And that head is the Catholicos, or the Patriarch of Babylon, which is in modern-day Iraq. That was the um, center of the Persian Empire at that time. Its theology comes out of this Antiochian theological tradition. So Theodore of Mopsuestia is the most important theologian for this tradition. Its liturgy is in Eastern Syriac, which is actually in its own way a dialect of Aramaic which is a language that Jesus and the first Christians spoke. What do we call this church? You might have heard of this church in terms of being called the Nestorian Church, but its members today call themselves Assyrian Christians. They still exist um, in Iraq, in parts of the United States, and Europe. The official name of it is the Assyrian Catholic Apostolic Church of the East. Geographically, this was the biggest Christian church before the year 1500. It spanned from Syria to India to China. I have a map up on the Populi course site that gives you a sense of its far reach. As you look at that, the place where the various crosses are represent different kinds of Episcopal sees where uh, bishops were um, located. This, as you look at the map here, shows that this is a church that was the only one in the pre-modern era that really encountered Buddhism or other so-called Eastern religions. And as we think about it, it develops alongside the rise of Islam in some of these contexts also. So let's think about the founding of the Church of the East a little bit. Um, one of the things to keep in mind here is the Persian Empire was the main geopolitical rival of the Roman Empire. And the boundary between the uh, Roman and Persian empires lay along the Euphrates River. And so Persia becomes this linking point between Arabia, India, and Central Asia, as you see in the map, and then to points to the west of it and to the southwest of it, Egypt the Horn of Africa, Eastern Mediterranean. The rulers of the Persian Empire are called Shahs, and they often view Christians as suspect people, because especially after Constantine, and certainly with the, by the time of Theodosius, Christians in the empire seem as potentially pro-Roman, and thus potential traitors to the Persian Empire. And thus Christianity is also seen as a potential rival to Zoroastrianism, which was a state religion. Yet nonetheless, often you do have Christian minorities holding high positions at the court of the Shah. Uh, positions like translators, ambassadors, physicians, uh, political consultants. There would be periodic cycles of persecution of these Christians especially if a war was uh, underway against Rome, and there's periodic and frequent border wars. For our purposes, let's think about the Christology of the Church of the East. And one of the things I want to highlight here to you is how there's a movement here between the specific language we might use for Jesus Christ and the underlying truth or the underlying grammar, perhaps, of what we're trying to get at when we speak about who Jesus Christ is. So often the, the Christology of the Church of the East is labeled Nestorian. That's a little misleading because the theology develops well after Nestorius. 
Better to use a phrase like non-Chalcedonian or diophysite, which emphasizes two natures, the two natures of Christ. So here's a distinction that might help you. Chalcedonian thought, the thought of Eastern Orthodoxy and of, uh, Western Catholic Christianity, emphasizes the union of two natures centered in a single hypostasis of Jesus Christ. So in Jesus Christ is the unity of divinity and humanity in this single person. A diophysite thought, like with the Church of the East, emphasizes that the natures of Jesus Christ, humanity and divinity, meet at a point of union. So it's almost like thinking of this in different terms of spatial metaphors. In the 5th and 6th centuries, as the Church of the East is organizing itself, it adopts the Trinitarian doctrines found at Nicaea and Constantinople from those councils, and thus also adopts the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, but it does not affirm the Christological doctrines of Chalcedon. To understand a little bit more about what this Christology looks like, let's talk for a minute about uh, the Christology as it develops out of Baha'i the Great, who was one of the prominent theologians from the 7th century in the Church of the East. And what Baha'i does is he develops a Christology, a Diophysite Christology, that develops a notion of a triple distinction within the conversation of nature and persons. And it's a distinction between three terms that are Syriac, not Greek. Kiana, Knoma, and Parsopa. So let's just walk through these to see how this kind of theology works. Kiana refers to, uh, as equivalent to the Greek term phusis, or nature. And here it means a nature at a general or abstract level. So humanity. There is a general human nature. That is a Kiana. We can then think of parsopa, which is loaned in a way from the similar Greek word, to think about person or hypostasis, which here means a concrete self-subsisting individual. So my parsopa, I have a nature, which is humanity, and then my particular parsopa. What Baha'i wants to do is ask, how more fully does Kiana and Parsopa relate to each other? And so he develops uh, another concept around the term Kenoma. Here, Kenoma refers to a mediation between Kiana and Parsopa. Kenoma is a thing that moves between an abstract humanity and a specific person. So, in a way, Kenoma specifies the Parsopa. Kenoma is Kiana as it exists in a particular and individualized way in a Parsopa. So, it's really trying, uh, Kenoma is really talking about how you are you and not just someone who looks slightly different than another person who also has human nature. So let's work through this in terms of a model. So let's talk about this this way. Kiana, human nature. What's an aspect of human nature? One way of thinking about this is all human beings possess language, right? We all have language. This is a quality of being human. On the level of Parsopa, we have Emily Dickinson, who was a human being. And a canoma of Emily Dickinson is that she used language especially well. A canoma of Emily Dickinson is to be a poet who is using the general human capacity for language in a very particularized way. So let's think about this now in a Christological usage. So let's think about this in terms of who Jesus Christ is. Jesus Christ possesses two Kiana, 
or two natures, and two kenome that are expressed in one persopa, one person. So he has a human kiana, humanity, and a divine kiana. He has a human kenoma, which is to be a first century Jew, born the Virgin Mary, living in a very specific and particular way. And a divine kenoma, only begotten son. And then the parsopa is Jesus Christ, who is the integrated individual possessing both the human and the divine natures. Now you might get to the end here and think, well, isn't that actually a lot like the Council of Chalcedon? I think this is one of the things that is important for us to look at is that there is a lot invested in how language is happening here because the idea is that language is helping you get at a further refinement of truth. We don't have to adopt the Christology of the Church of the East, but what we want to do is reflect on how language is attempting to get at deeper truths. And because language is limited, we have to continue to pursue further refinements of our language to arrive at truth. It's actually not to abandon language at expressing truth, but more fully pursue the truth that our language drives us towards. And of course, always in conversation with the ultimate authority of revealed scripture. So the Church of the East is a uh, entity we're going to return to when we think about the spread of Christianity to China that will be in a few weeks. I look forward to our conversation around this and our other conversations about Christianity outside of the Roman Empire to follow.